Thank you for joining us today. I am a wallpower. My brief visual description is I am a white male wearing glasses with hazel eyes and a blue and white collared shirt with a brown tie. My pronouns are he, him, his. My virtual background is a three-story brick academic building that has offices for the Human Development Institute. I'm going to provide a few housekeeping details and then turn it over to Dr. Rachel Womack, the Human Development Institute's Lend and Training Director, to introduce our topic and speakers today. We use Zoom for our virtual platform. Our speakers will provide an opportunity for questions today. Please type your questions for our speakers in the Q&A box for a robust question and answer session. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see the Q&A option. Please use the chat box for technical questions. We have real-time captioning for the webinar in the closed captioning feature. Turn on the captioning by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then clicking show subtitle. Should you have any questions, about CEUs, you can contact me. My email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Again, my email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Please take a moment to complete our brief <laughs> evaluation. You will receive an email that provides a link to access the session evaluation after the seminar. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming webinars. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Rachel Womack. Thank you so much, Walt. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone today to the second in our three-part spring seminar series. The title of today's seminar is Exploring Early Childhood, Early Supports to Build a Strong Foundation. As Dr. Bauer mentioned, my name is Dr. Rachel Womack. I am the training director here at the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And to give you a brief visual description, I am a white woman with a curly brown hair. I am wearing glasses and a kind of tan colored blazer today. Uh, my virtual background is pink and has our Lend logo on it. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our wonderful panel of speakers today. Um, our presenters include Angela Cooper, who is a regional child care administrator for Child Care Aware of Kentucky at the Human Development Institute. Kate Dean is also a regional child care administrator for Child Care Aware of Kentucky at the Human Development Institute. Christine Hausman is the content coordinator of training for child care aware of Kentucky at the Human Development Institute. And Joanne Rojas is the Associate Director for Child Care Aware of Kentucky here at the Human Development Institute. And with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker, who is Christine Hausman. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in and joining us this afternoon. Um, I am actually just starting off by giving some um, kind of housekeeping details for our early care and education folks. I know this is an uh, invitation went out to a broad audience, but if you are needing early care and education hours, I know that you are well trained to uh, type your name and email into the chat box. But um, for the purposes of this <laughs> webinar, we are able to capture that information on the back end of Zoom. So there's no need to do that today. So uh, just kind of giving you that information. Um, and with that being said, I will be officially turning over the presentation kickoff to um, Dr. Angela Cooper. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Angela Cooper. I want to give a brief visual description of myself. I am a mid-50s white woman. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I, you know, I have dark brown hair, short, wearing glasses, my background is blurred, and I am wearing a zebra black and white striped sweater over a pink shirt. So um, since my section is all about unlocking the power of play, we're going to start with a bit of fun. I have set up a word cloud, and I would like you to click the link in the chat or use the QR code to answer the following question. What type of play or play thing 
do you remember most from your childhood? Has everyone frozen? Can hear you, Angela? We, we can hear you, Angela. Oh, okay, great. It looked like everything was frozen on the screen. I was just checking. Okay, so I see lots of answers coming in. Um, swimming, Link, oh, Lincoln Logs. I haven't thought of Lincoln Logs in years. My backyard, outdoor, baby dolls, dollhouses. Um, you can put more than one answer in the um, Mentimeter word cloud. Barbies, lots of Barbies and dolls, Legos. Oh, Big Wheel. I haven't thought of that in a long time either. Etch-a-sketch. Lots of great answers. Keep them coming. Board games. Polly Pockets. Oh, my daughter used to play with Polly Pockets when she was a little girl. This is bringing back lots of memories from my own childhood and from raising my daughter. Um, lots of playing outside. Littlest pet shops. Uh, bike riding. Just had neighborhood children in a large group riding bikes. And um, this week after school, it was lovely to see. Oh, what else do we have? Hmm. Simon, I can't see them all. Outside all day. Oh, yes. Outside all day. If, if, yes, I am a child that was born of outside all day. Um, lots of swimming. I see um, boxes. Oh, yeah. Pool. Somebody's put something in the chat. I see that in the pool. Pretend play bike riding, take a couple more, uh, kick the can, oh, haven't thought of that in a long time, great ideas, wonderful <laughs> memories, easy bake oven, so, um, Thank you all for participating um, in that session of Word Cloud. Lots of good memories, lots of good play or play thing ideas. Um, so today in my session, we are going to embark on a journey to explore the magical world of play. So whether you're a parent, an educator, or just simply curious about child development, this session is going to reveal how play shapes young minds and how it continues throughout the lifespan. So let's get started by defining play. So in an article published by, um, in Psychology Today entitled The Value of Play, The Definition of Play Gives Insights by Dr. Peter Gray, a research professor and an author at Boston College and the um, Boston College, he uses the following five characteristics to define play. Number one, he says play is self-chosen and it's self-directed. Players are always free to quit. Play is an activity which the means are more valued than the ends. Play has a structure or rules, but it's not dictated by physical necessity, but instead from the minds of the players. Play is imaginative non-literal, mentally removed, and in some ways, it doesn't have anything to do with real or serious life. And lastly, play involves an active, alert, and non-stressed mindset. So I wanted to talk um, first a little bit about how play fits in as an inclusive force. So we know play has no boundaries. Um, play in early childhood, especially, transcends all backgrounds, um, cultures, and all abilities. So it weaves kind of a vibrant tapestry of shared experiences and growth. So let's talk a little bit about what that might look like 
from a cultural perspective. So we know children um, absorb cultural aspects like routines, values, and rules through play. They creatively assimilate these elements, adapting them into um, their games. So for instance, if a child comes from a storytelling culture, they might weave narratives into their imaginative play. So within play, microcultures begin to emerge among peer groups. These shared meanings and routines um, go beyond individual backgrounds. So whether children are building sandcastles, inventing secret handshakes, um, playing hopscotch, children create their unique world of play. And when they do this, cultural differences just fade away. So children, um, in doing that, they bring their culturally based expectations, their skills, talents, and values to the classroom. So we know that children's self-concept is partly um, formed from how others perceive them. So to develop positive self-concepts, children must honor and respect their own cultures and families. And then when the classroom reflects and validates their identities, they feel more seen, valued, and competent. Now, NACI, or the National Association for the Education of Young Children, emphasizes equity in early childhood education. And they state that teachers must understand their own culture to appreciate children's diverse backgrounds. So they must be self-aware. They must use a family-centered approach, respect um, families' languages, their cultures, and incorporate those into the teaching practice and their learning environments developmentally, culturally, and linguistic appropriate practices build on children's strengths their, and consider their unique backgrounds. So we know that playful learning leverages active, engaging, and meaningful thinking. So it bridges gaps by embracing diversity and creating um, inclusive environments. When play becomes the canvas, um, for cultural expectations and explorations, children develop empathy and they broaden their worldviews. So if we take a moment as early childhood educators or the early childhood educators that are on here, we know that play presents broad opportunities. And we especially know this is true for children with special needs. It is said that play often becomes an inclusive bridge. So play, if you think of it as a really skilled little chameleon, it just adapts to each child's unique needs. So when teachers use play-based curricula, it opens doors for learning that may otherwise stay closed. Play should not be seen as um, a tangible item toward learning, but instead, experts say, we should view it in as a natural way young children learn. So the parts of the brain um, that are most developed in early childhood are the ones that respond to active experiences. D. Ray, she's a professor of early childhood education and the director at the Center for Play Therapy um, at the University of North Texas College of Education. She says the brain is structured to learn from experience first and then learn from all the other means and ways we teach. She also says play is essential to education and play is education for all children. So some of the ways educators or even caregiving adults could support opportunities through play is by observing children's interests, their preferences, and taking note of their developmental stage. They can in turn use this type of knowledge to customize play experiences and tailor activities to meet individual needs of children and classrooms as a whole. Another way that we can create play spaces to accommodate 
diverse abilities is to use universal design and to encourage and foster play that connects children so that they can learn from one another. And when they do so, they build empathy, understanding through those connections. Play accommodates a wide range of communication styles. We know that not all children express themselves through words. Others use gestures, signs, or pictures. So use of visual schedules and cues can guide play routines, providing predictability in their day and also reducing stress and anxiety. It's important to foster emotional regulation through play spaces. And that includes things like cozy areas or nooks. Children often retreat when overwhelmed and find solace in quiet play. For children that need to explore emotions or big feelings, we can create spaces for that too, for role playing and acting out scenarios. You might see educators use individualized education plans, IEPs, or individualized family service plan, plans, um, IFSPs, to align educational goals with play for children in school and in early childhood settings. So occupational, physical, speech, and language therapists, they often integrate play within their daily work as well to address specific needs such as motor skills, um, sensory integration, language, and social skills. I think it's important when we talk about play that we need to remember play is not a one-size-fits-all suit. It's a tailor-made ensemble and it's stitched with care for each child's unique journey. So if we think back to what I've just previously talked about, we've learned that play has a remarkable impact. Um, play is a catalyst for children's development. And so I'd like to take a moment and just um, explore the reasons um, why this is um, the case. So in brain development, we know that play has been shown to support brain structure, synapsis connection, and improves brain plasticity. And those are all crucial for learning and adaptability. Through play, children also learn important social emotional skills, such as self-regulation, empathy, and cooperation. It's those playful interactions with peers and trusted adults that help build safe and nurturing relationships. Play encourages creativity and imagination. So whether children are building with blocks, pretending to be superheroes, creating art, children are engaging in activities that foster creative thinking. Play provides opportunities for problem solving whether it's figuring out how to fit puzzle pieces together, resolving conflicts during imaginative play, children learn to persist and, excuse me, and find solutions. Playful activities embedded in literacy and language enhances engagement in reading and language. But additionally, it causes or it, um, develops planning, problem solving, and comprehension skills. These are all skills that are learned, taught, and learned through play. Climbing, exploring, and trying new things build resilience, and children learn to assess the risk and bounce back from setbacks. So play is not just about having fun. It's truly a fundamental part of early childhood development. It starts, um, it supports development, growth across all domains, and it lays a foundation for lifelong learning and well being. So, we've talked a little bit about early childhood. Now, I would like to go into um, how play transcends the lifespan and how it touches every corner of development. So, play is um, fascinating. It is a fascinating aspect of human development, not just child development, because it extends across the whole um, lifespan. 
So if we thought about play in the lifespan, we talked a little bit about early childhood. I'd like to revisit that just a little to show how it transcends the different stages of life. So in infancy, play evolves around exploring the world through their senses and movement. Babies learn by touching and tasting and manipulating objects. As they move into toddlerhood, they engage in imaginative play, pretending to be different characters and acting out scenarios. This type of play really fosters creativity and social skills. In middle childhood, children start to get into the constructive play. They build things, they create art, they solve puzzles. And this type of play enhances cognitive abilities, problem solving and fine motor skills. Kids play together, forming friendships and learning teamwork through cooperative play, such as games, sports, group activities. Now, when they reach those teen years, it changes up just a little. Teens start to engage more in social interactions and they start forming deep connections um, with their peers. They identify their identity and explore it. They start to identify and explore self-expression and emotional regulation. Now, adolescents may still enjoy the fantasy worlds through books, movies, and video games. And believe it or not, this play allows them to explore different realities, emotion, problem solve, and use cognitive skills as well. So that brings us to adulthood. So we start to think as adults that we've lost the ability or the um, imagination to play, but that truly isn't so. Isn't so. Um, adults often engage in what we would call leisure play. So it's hobbies or sports or recreational activities that may um, provide relaxation, stress relief, and just personal fulfillment. So whether it's writing, painting, playing a musical instrument, um, this allows adults to express themselves and maintain a sense of wonder. The last and final stage of the lifespan is older adulthood. So seniors often reminisce about their past experiences, sharing stories and memories. This play helps maintain cognitive function and social bonds and provides a sense of um, wonder for older adults. As people age, they may also start to seek out um, meaning and purpose. So they engage in spiritual practices such as meditation and connecting with nature. These are all forms of transcendent play. So there's some examples of how play extends across the lifespan. Um, it really evolves through life, adapting our changing needs and, our, and to our changing needs and to our circumstances. But yet it remains always a vital part of human existence, promoting learning, joy, and connection. So now that we've near the end of my part of the presentation, I'd just like to take a moment to share a story that is a tremendous example of how play um, affects development in children with special needs and can tie this presentation together. This story was shared with me while I was conducting qualitative interviews while working on my dissertation entitled Perceptions of Play-Based Curricula as an Effective Model of Instruction for Children with Special Needs. While I was conducting interviews, some of the teachers had explained um, how language development can be affected um, through teaching with children diagnosed with special needs. And one teacher in particular, Teacher C, she detailed how in her classroom, children with special needs seem to grasp concepts through play that they didn't necessarily grasp um, through um, teacher-led or whole group or small group instruction. So she provided the example of a four-year-old boy with Down syndrome in her class who was nonverbal. She used communication cards, modeled language, and labeled for him. 
one day he was working in a small group in the learning center with a with other group of children on a floor puzzle. And when they completed the puzzle, they all clapped and verbalized their happiness and identified the puzzle that they had revealed. Well, student B, he jumped up from the floor, he clapped and he said, pup, pup. His classmates continued to cheer him on and he repeated, pup, pup. This was the first word the child had ever spoken in their presence. She went on to say that they went on through the rest of the year watching his vocabulary increase to one and two word phrases consistently by the end of the year. This is just a real life, a real world example of how play is a, is a conduit for learning. All children learn through play. They all learn through hands-on activities, peer and teacher interactions. Children learn through play. Play is education. In closing, I'd just like to leave you with a thought. Play is not an extracurricular activity. It is the heartbeat of childhood. So I would like to thank you for participating in this portion of the seminar. We're going to drop a few resource links in the chat for you. And at this time, I would like to turn the present presentation over to my colleague, Christine Hausman. We can see you, Christine, but you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. All right, well, my name is Christine Hausman, and while I work for Child Care Aware, another component of my role is as the Learn the Signs Act Early Ambassador to the CDC. And that is a passion project of mine as a former early interventionist early in my career. Uh, so what we are going to talk about uh, in this next chunk of our presentation is utilizing is utilizing different developmental tracking tools to help identify um, and support children and their families by um, linking them to appropriate services. So here we go. Um, I forgot to mention my visual description, so I apologize. I'm gonna backtrack here. Um, I am a white middle-aged female with wavy hair, um, slightly graying, and I have chin length hair. I'm wearing a black and white flowered shirt, thinking positively that spring is actually on the way. My virtual background is blurred and my pronouns are she, her, hers. All right. So here we are with the, um, this uh, QR code that I would appreciate if any of you have not um, downloaded the Milestone Tracker app, I just put that code up there so that you can maybe snap a picture of it and go ahead and download that because we will be touching base about that shortly. All right, so um, why is it so important to monitor developmental milestones? When families um, receive their baby, when they have a baby or when they um, become a parent, those babies do not come with instruction manuals. And oftentimes families will Google and one of the top things that new parents Google are about developmental milestones. 70% of families Google about asking about appropriate developmental milestones. So the CDC has um, provided some materials for families. Uh, these materials have been around for about 20 years or so and were originally created to help identify children that were on the autism spectrum. That was their initial intent. However, we really want to be supporting 
all parents and all children, celebrating and anticipating all developmental milestones, as well as if it is detected that there are some questions about development that we quote unquote, learn the signs of child development and act early should we have any concerns. All right, so here is a statistic that I think is very important. So developmental disabilities are quite common and oftentimes are not identified prior to school age. Here in Kentucky, um, less than 50% of children are um, kindergarten ready, according to our kindergarten readiness testing data. Um, one in six children nationwide um, are eventually um, considered as having a developmental disability. And that number is even higher in frequency with lower income families. And that, that rate is at one in five children. So though that's kind of the why we want to identify these children as quickly as possible. And the current autism um, prevalence numbers are one in 36. So um, that's another reason that we really want to be as attentive um, to the development of children and making sure that families and physicians and all of the service providers that work directly with families are keeping their eyes out and helping to monitor and track development. So these tools that we're going to talk about this morning or this afternoon uh, relate to, uh, we'll cover these four different areas of development. So it kind of looks at the developmental domains of social emotional, as well as communication, cognition, and motor milestones. And again, these tools that we're gonna look at are developed through the CDC in cooperation with the American Academy of Pediatrics. So here are the three main tools. There is the Milestone Tracker app that if you did capture that QR code and have downloaded the app, this is what it should look like. It is the app that has like little stepping stones on the icon of the app. And this is once it's downloaded, this little fella Jaden here um, at the 10 month old level, that is what the app should look like. There is also what I call one pager checklist, developmental checklists, and those are available in a multitude of developmental ages, starting at two months and going on up to the age of five years. On the front of that, it has all of the developmental milestones in those four areas, those four developmental domains that we just discussed. And then on the back, it also has developmentally appropriate, just like what Dr. Cooper was referring to, um, different ways to play with your child, different ways, um, different skills to work on as far as communication and social emotional development and, you know, things that um, children should be doing as far as feeding and all across all different areas of development. Because the CDC really is focusing a lot of their efforts on helping young families be prepared um, to meet the needs of their children and establishing really strong, healthy relationships and healthy habits in that early childhood window. Because we know that whatever happens in that early childhood window will stay with them moving forward. So on the backs of these sheets, there's lots and lots of ideas that teachers can use in classrooms, that families can use in their home, um, that they can use across all settings. And then the third tool is our Milestone Moments booklet. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So here is a closer look at the Milestone Moments, at uh, the mi Milestone Checklist. These checklists are available in many, many languages. You can go to the Learn the Signs Act Early website um, through the CDC and download them in multiple languages. All of our materials are translated in English and Spanish, but these particular checklists are downloadable in many additional languages. So. Uh, check those out if you are serving a family that speaks a, a language other than English or Spanish. And if you do have a family that speaks a language that is not 
on the official list, reach out to me because I may be able to get a copy of that for you from one of my fellow ambassadors. The Milestone oh, yeah, Moments booklet here uh, is a compilation of all of the different developmental levels. And it's in a cute little booklet that fits in a diaper bag, real handy. Um, it's nice for families to write down a celebration of, oh, they did this milestone or a, oh, I'm really concerned about this particular thing. So the next time I go to school or the next time I go to the doctor, I can reach out and ask that question. We're all so busy. And I think having one central place to write down your question or concern or celebration um, is often helpful. It has all of those fun activities that you can do. And it also has a developmental tracker um, snapshot in, in it that you can share with your physician. It outlines all of the uh, developmental ages and it will even indicate when you need to have the developmental screens and the autism screens. So that's important for um, families and physicians to just kind of have that, that snapshot. All right, if you could, please go ahead and um, download the app. I would really appreciate you just kind of pointing your phone um, to towards that QR code and downloading that QR code. You don't have to answer all the questions right now, although I honestly wouldn't mind. <laughs> You're welcome to do that if you wish. But that QR code will, will download that app and it will show you how to um, move through the app and answer the questions at a... Um, for just as a family would. I'm going to leave that up there a little bit. Some of my other favorite things about the app are um, you can enter multiple children in there. You can, um, it's available in English and Spanish. It will circle back and remind you to answer those questions at once your child hits that next developmental level. You can um, have it adjust for prematurity. So if a child is born um, premature, you can enter that information and it will correct the child's developmental age for those first two years. So the app has kind of some added bells and whistles, I like to say. Um, families carry it with them all the time. Most, most families that have a phone have it with them. And it will also give a place to write notes in there if families do have a question or concern. So um, it also has little video clips and little photos of the milestones themselves. Sometimes if a family is not quite sure if their child is doing a particular milestone, you can click on a picture, you can click on a little video and think, oh yes, she's totally doing that. Or maybe you say not sure or not yet. And that app will send you a push notification to um, revisit that with you and make sure that you are paying close attention to that because you may just not have noticed that or realize that a child of the age of three should be able to do that, but they clearly are doing that. And so you can check that box and, and move forward. Here is another snapshot of um, a picture of the app itself. And you'll notice here, it says my child's summary. So if a child, um, is developing totally on track and everything is going smoothly, you have that record of that. If something starts to look or feel um, a little concerning to you, you can kind of go back and say, oh, language was really on track up to this point. And then all of a sudden something changed. So that's really good information to relay to um, your physician or your teacher or um, or during if a, if a referral is made to an early intervention program. Now, if you do have concerns about one of your students or one of your um, family members, what we really urge you to do is speak directly to your physician. Um, we really don't want you to kind of wait and see. These um, milestones have been normed at 
75% of children should be able to accomplish these different skills. So if your child or your student is not um, hitting those, those milestones, it would really be wise to speak with the family and encourage them um, to reach out and talk to their physician about it. And we all know early intervention is best. The earlier we can intervene, the better. And it's never too late to start is what I want people to, to really understand. So the earlier we intervene, the earlier we can help support the family, support the child, link them with services, um, intervene um, in the classroom, in the home, wherever the child really, um, their, their primary environments, making sure that they have the supports to be successful. Now, if a child is under the age of three, um, what, what the services that we want to link them to would be to Kentucky Early Intervention System. You may have known them as First Steps. They're kind of uh, rebranding themselves. And so I just like to use both of those terms at this point. And families can refer themselves. Um, a child care program can refer a child if they have a concern. And you just need to say, I have concerns about my child's development and I would like to have them evaluated. If the child is over three, we want them to be referred to the local public school system. Or if a family is um, just worried about speech, for instance, then, then maybe they can go the, the private therapy route. So it's really up to them and what they're comfortable with, and uh, you can provide them with those options. The CDC also has some other storybooks, which are really, really fun. And they cover, um, they're just storybooks that are fun to read but they also have resources in the back and they have the milestones kind of tucked into the pages. So whoever the caregiver is that's reading the stories will be reminded of those particular milestones for that child at that age. So this is a place that you can order free storybooks. Now, I know that we have a number of child care providers, or at least that's my hope on uh, joining us today. And I wanted to let you know that we have an opportunity for you to engage with, um, with our program, our partnership with Help Me Grow. So Help Me Grow Kentucky and Child Care Aware of Kentucky have a partnership. And if you reach out to us, we can help get you on board with free developmental screening through the ASQ in partnership and, and pairing alongside the developmental monitoring of Learn the Signs Act Early. These complement each other beautifully. Um, we know we have the data to prove that if both of developmental monitoring and screening are going on simultaneously, children are identified at an earlier age, which is our goal. So if you are interested in this, you can speak with your child care aware health and safety or quality coaches, or you can reach out to me uh, directly. There's also going to be a link in the chat that you can complete a survey and answer those questions and we will reach out to you and get you onboarded right away. And that is free to child care centers. So don't delay. A couple other resources that I think are fabulous for young families is um, Kentucky is now onboarded across 120 counties for the, uh, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. So if you have families that have a child between birth and age five, they can sign up for to receive a free library, a free library, <laughs> a free book mailed just for them um, to their home. It's a great resource. And room.org is another one I like to share, and that is a great resource. It's a text-based resource for families. It really helps them um, give them ideas of things to do with their child at the various developmental ages. And they're all just incorporated in everyday activities, and it explains like the why behind what you're doing, because that brain is so um, growing so rapidly and pruning and, and really developing, and you can't 
Um, sometimes families don't understand the significance of that window of time. So this really reminds families of the importance of early, early brain development. And I like to call parents brain builders, you know, I like to make sure that teachers, early childhood teachers understand their significant role. Um, and if you see yourself as like an architect of that baby's brain and really helping them build that super strong foundation that the rest of their life will um, be based on, um, it, that cannot be understated. So in a nutshell, <laughs> those are some tools and resources for families and for child care providers and for medical health care professionals that are whoever is interfacing with our young families. We want them to have the tools that they need at their fingertips to feel confident in supporting their children, confident in identifying developmental milestones, and really knowing that they should trust their gut. And if they have a hunch that something might not be quite right, to really follow through with that and, and reach out to their physician um, and talk to them about any concerns that they have. So um, we are here at Child Care Aware to support our um, child care providers and provide those resources to families in our communities. All right. So thank you for um, allowing me to share about Learn the Signs, Act Early. I know that there have been some links put in the chat regarding some of the resources that I have shared, but we were going to take a little pause here to see if there were any questions from our um, audience here or any feedback that you wanted to share regarding some of the content that has been shared so far. And if anyone has a question, feel free to put that information in the chat. And we're going to be monitoring the chat to um, answer those questions. And um, I don't see any questions coming in right now. So I know I bet that um, we have a few questions from our uh, presenter panel. I, I have a question, Christine. Um, could you provide some ideas on how um, early childhood professionals could utilize the Learn the Science Act early materials within their classrooms um, for monitoring children's development? Absolutely. Uh, so Learn the Science Act early has these developmental checklists has the app, has all of these tools. And I think as children are coming into your program, if it just becomes a natural part of your program, if if that information is available in an orientation or a welcome packet, if that information is posted on school bulletin boards or could be included in, oh, your child's just moved to the two-year-old classroom and you shared the two-year-old developmental milestones, those are just kind of putting those um, pieces of information out there in a visible way. I think that uh, teachers, as they're getting ready to have um, conferences or meetings with families about how their child is doing, they can encourage families to complete that milestone tracker app or a checklist in advance of that sit down meeting so that they can really kind of go through and make sure that their child is um, hitting all of those developmental milestones. I also think, you know, sometimes if you just need, if teachers need some ideas of fun things to do at each of those developmental ages, if you flip that sheet over, you'll have um, quite a list of fun things to do with children at each age. Thank you, Christine. I really um, enjoy the idea of early childhood professionals being able to share that just widely um, within their classrooms as well. Thank you for that information. Sure. Families really love it. So I have a question because I, I wanted to go back to Angela's presentation because we're since we're breaking this in two, we've got two presentations and then questions and then two presentations. So um, Dr. Cooper, I'm curious with play. I know one of the things I sometimes hear either um, child care professionals or families saying to me is, 
you know, I would love to play with my kids or I'd love to make space for the play, but I'm tired and it makes a big mess. And I am just not prepared to play all the time. Isn't it better just to, you know, get the, maybe get them in front of a computer game to learn their ABCs or something like that when they're young? What, what are your thoughts on integrating play when you're busy and tired? So I think one of the first things you have to do is acknowledge um, their feelings, you know, that you hear them, that you understand they're busy, that parenting can be exhausting. And I think you validate their experience. So I, I also believe at that point, I would highlight the importance of play, um, talk to them about how play is crucial for child development and just suggest really simple activities they can do. It, it could be as simple as introducing a math concept while you're cooking supper at night. You're measuring, you're cutting, you're stirring, you're doing all those math and science concepts right there at your kitchen counter. So I think um, also encouraging the joy of connection with their child. And that kind of lends to what um, Christine was talking about in the Learn the Signs Act early, that, you know, that shared experience of the parent and the child bonding and doing something together. So um, I think that those would be my suggestions and just offering supportive solutions um, for ways they could easily work in play um, to their day. I'm just looking in the chat and Lauren Rachel says she loves scavenger hunt cards and Simon says when she's tired. <laughs> so that's, I'm sure we just kind of each choose a few little go-tos that are easy just to pull out of your pocket that <laughs> will give you a, a few minutes of um, fun connection time. Those are great. Anybody else have other suggestions on what they do? <laughs> Um, I, I want to also make the suggestion, if I was talking to one of those parents, I would suggest, especially when you're tired, that you do something that you like to do and let the child do their child appropriate version of that. So it might be, oh, mommy is going to sit and read her magazine. And so it's time for you to sit with your with your books. And so model the behavior that you want to see and show them you relaxing. So you, Because when you're allowing a child to play, you don't necessarily have to do everything with them. You can show them, I'm doing my playtime, you do your playtime, and everybody's doing what is most important for them at that time. I love that um, idea. Thank you for contributing that, Joanne. I love that too. And it reminds me, I didn't put this in the word cloud when we started, but it brought up um, a really great memory where, well, as you can tell, when I share my visual description a little bit later, I am a middle-aged white woman. And um, one of the things that I did in my childhood was type on a typewriter. And I would type just gibberish. I never, I mean, it was before I could put sentences together and I would make these long paragraphs and then I would present them to my parents to read. And they would always read these like very wild words that they would try their best to actually read through with, you know, sound and big facial expressions and all of this. And it would take them, you know, maybe a couple of minutes, but for something that would take me 20 minutes to a half an hour. So they would get this great break. And then we could have imaginative play together when it was a little bit more convenient for my parents. So I love these examples. I, I would like to point out too, Hope said in the chat, then in my interaction with parents, I always try to highlight the fact that play can be in everyday interactions. So playing peekaboo in the grocery store, finding colors of cars while on car rides, et cetera. It doesn't have to be something huge and difficult to do. I hope I would absolutely agree with that. And I would also like to say it doesn't have to involve what uh, what we would consider toys or education materials at all times either. So um, there are lots of things you can do identifying letters on cereal boxes, um, lots of things you can do using a list at the grocery store. So um, all great, great suggestions.
Mary Howard is saying that pretend play with her mom was always fun. We would act out characters and books. What I would do to see one of those videotapes, Miss Mary. <laughs> but yes, that is that is always that is always super, super fun. And just like pull, you know, clothes out of the closet and just like find little simple props. They'll make props out of anything. Um, but that storytelling or switching up the ending or um, there's just endless amounts of things that you can do related to to books to just kind of bring them to life. So that is super fun. And when you're talking about just like looking at in your environment and finding the colors and finding the shapes and finding the letters, um, I think that room.org, that text-based app really gives lots of good ideas because that might be intuitive to us in the field, you know, um, but to some families, they might not realize, um, they might not see the same things that some of us may see. And it, it really breaks it down and helps the family to just like really um, engage and look for very, very specific things. You know, when you're going for a walk through the neighborhood, when you're at the grocery store, just as was shared. So that's a really, really um, good tip. Um, Christine, I would like to read one more. I know we're getting close to our time and probably for you to introduce the next speaker, but I would like to say too, Lauren um, spoke in the chat about there being a lot of pressure on parents to entertain or keep busy. It's different than just existing in their playscape. We can overcomplicate it. So as adults, we can often overcomplicate the play, but kids just know how to do it intuitively. And that is exactly why play is education for children. So with that, Christine, I'll move to you and your next introduction. All right. Well, thank you for those um, contributions. I am going to now turn it over to Kate Dean, who is um, <laughs> the, the Regional Child Care Administrator in our Northern Bluegrass region. Take it away, Kate. Wonderful. Well, I am just enjoying um, every bit of the conversation that we are having so far. Um, I will share a visual brief visual description. Um, I am a uh, middle-aged white woman. I have um, dark brown wavy hair about shoulder length. I am wearing glasses and my background today is a blur blurred picture of my office um, that has a, a bit of a yellow hue. And um, the topic that I'm going to cover today is preventing suspensions and expulsions. And we're going to talk a lot about um, how um, some of the things that we heard from Dr. Cooper and also the tools that Christine shared with us can play a role in preventing suspension and expulsion, which in the long run means that um, we are supporting lifelong inclusion. Um, so my overarching goal will be to increase our understanding of how early identification can support lifelong inclusion with a focus on the impacts of early suspensions and expulsions from child care. Um, and we are going to go to just a quick poll. So as we did with a previous presentation, you can um, use this QR code to capture um, the Mentimeter site, uh, or you can click in the link. And I believe if it's not already been put in there that a, that, um, a friend was going to put that in the chat for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move on to our Mentimeter. So the question we're answering today is, um, Expulsion from child care negatively impacts early identification of developmental delays. Does this not really have any fit at all? Um, does it rarely have an impact? Sometimes have an impact, often have an impact, or all of the time have an impact? And I see those answers starting to come in. So let's keep them coming. All right, I see often winning so far. Okay. All sorts of changes. I find this part fun because you can see as the answers come in, you've got a little bit of something going back and forth here, right? Okay, so I see here that 
first and um, second place for answers are that expulsion from child care negatively impacts early identification of developmental delays primarily often or all of the time. And we are going to talk a little bit now about how that fits. Um, I'm going to stop sharing just so that we can have a conversation. Um, all right. So um, at, I work with Child Care Aware of Kentucky, and one of the um, considerations and concerns of the Division of Child Care, and then also nationally, the um, the division of the federal division of child care is to reduce um, suspensions and expulsions. And this is a uh, such a great need that that some of our federally funded partners, including Head Start, um, have um, policies that prohibit expulsion and suspension from any of the settings in their classrooms. Um, it's a little bit of a complicated topic to try to gather data surrounding uh, because knowing that Head Start has it has policy that states exclusion is not um, possible. That means that sometimes if a child is asked to leave or or ends up leaving a program, there may be a reason outside of uh, the actual definition of um, expulsion or suspension. And we also see that in child care settings, um, it, there is no specific system in place to monitor or track the number of times that a child is um, asked to leave a facility, um, asked to leave a center. Uh, that is not something that is a part of our regulated system. And so without having that expectation, we don't have solid tangible numbers on that. Um, the public preschool system does, however, track this. And so looking at public school data, we find that approximately five out of every 1,000 children are expelled from public preschool. And when I'm talking about public pre preschool, we're talking primarily four-year-olds, some three-year-olds, but children definitely between three and five before they start kindergarten. And one of the reasons that this is such a uh, an alarming statistic is that these numbers are three times as high as what we see in the K through 12 system. And so if you look at that and you consider that preschool is one to two ages of a child compared to our entire K through 12 system, then that's an astronomical number of our littlest who are uh, being labeled as children who cannot maintain in the public system uh, or the public school system at such a very young age. Um, even more alarming is the fact that our African-American children, especially boys, are suspended 2.7 times more than our white peers. And so when you take that statistic and you combine it with um, the number of young children that are already being expelled uh, and asked not to come back to what is um, a part of their public education right, then we can start to see the astronomical concerns that come, um, especially for our African American students. What we're going to focus primarily on today is, is how um, expulsion creates a problem for individual children and also in the classroom, and then how we can connect uh, screening, assessment, and early intervention to the prevention of expulsion and suspension. So some of the issues that are created when a child is expelled is that each time they are required to leave a familiar environment, um, there is very often developmental or behavioral regression. Um, there can be learning regression, and there are studies that have shown that across all ages, when someone has to do a familiar task, but in a new setting, there is a change and a delay in their ability to uh, perform at the same level as prior to their changes. So you think about that with our, our youngest learners, um, and they're continuously falling behind when they're asked to leave. Um, there's also the, they, they miss out on um, the, their needs for social and emotional supports as they move into this new environment. So 
Continuity of care is one way that you can prevent um, some of these longer term learning or behavioral needs. Um, and when you have continuity of care, which is another way to, to talk about being in the same setting and not having an expulsion or suspension, um, there's an opportunity to, uh, to utilize screening and assessment to better understand and uh, I'm going to say parse out which experiences a child is having specific to the change that they've had to go through or and in fact a developmental delay. Um, screening is a very helpful tool in identifying gross growth areas for young children and when teachers and, and or parents utilize the information that they receive through screening. Uh, they can make a, a more accurate assessment of what to monitor and what to look for in uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and when you pair screening with ongoing assessment, then this also provides an opportunity for um, the child's learning to be individuated within a classroom of their, their peers. Um, this stable environment can help lead to a more accurate referral uh, for services as well. And so let's talk a little bit about that. So we've talked about um, how screening um, in conjunction with an ongoing assessment uh, and monitoring of the children, um, that provides a picture of what a child might need, what type of developmental delays there may be. Um, it also allows for information to be shared with families in a way that um, a child care provider could perhaps have a discussion with a family saying, these are some of the things that I've observed. This is what I've observed over time. And here are the tools that we've used for this observation. Are you seeing these kind of things at home? Is this something that is also uh, has, has come to your attention? Um, so it, it provides for those type of, of communications with families. Um, and then it can lead to a better understanding and gathering of information that could be used for a referral. Um, earlier, uh, we heard from Christine that there are a large number of supports within our um, early intervention system in Kentucky, including the Kentucky Early Intervention System, um, private <laughs> speech, um, OT and PT. We also have access in Kentucky to early childhood mental health specialists and to uh, child care aware coaches. And so through that whole system, we are able to provide um, coaching for children. We are able to, we being our Kentucky system, are able to uh, act upon on referrals and get children connected with um, what they need as far as services are concerned. We can create environments where those services can be more easily provided in child care settings. And then there are also opportunities to receive coaching through Child Care Aware of Kentucky that can assist um, administrators in the classrooms, teachers in the classrooms, and are based on valid and reliable tools like environmental rating scales. Um, and all of these can be very helpful prevention tools to um, help each child be able to develop um, as they are able and as is appropriate for them within a, a group setting. So what are some of the long-term implications of reducing suspension and expulsion? Um, what we primarily see is that children are then provided opportunities to grow and develop in a consistent environment. Um, they have access to uh, teachers, they have access to their peers, they have access to an environment that can help them uh, grow their executive function and their ability to manage, like Dr. Cooper said earlier, their big emotions, um, having consistent environments like that where uh, where each child is known as an individual um, without being expelled or suspended can assist with that. Um, they, they may also be able to receive the provision of services that support growth beyond just teaching in the classroom. Um, that is another big plus when a child is present. They have access in a way that they would not have if they were um, suspended or expelled. And then there's also an opportunity to uh, to be connected through appropriate referrals 
prior to school age so that when they do start, um, say, kindergarten, or if they are um, able to enter the public preschool system, that that that's that understanding of the child's need, that the individualized child's need has already um, been put in place. And I'll share just a very small story before um, my time is up. And that is, um, so my, uh, in, in a part of my parenting journey, um, I have a child who was identified with some additional needs when she was in uh, her childcare setting. And it was through the information that her teachers and the administration in that environment provided to me um, that helped me know when she entered the public school system in kindergarten and first grade that there were questions that I could ask the teacher of what was being, um, you know, what was happening in the classroom, how was she learning, how was she developing, these types of things. And in the long run, um, having the relationship with my child care provider, as well as um, learning from them the, the information that they shared through their, their screening, um, what they engaged me in with screening and their ongoing assessment, um, I was able to work with the schools to have her um, engaged in a 504 planning process later on. And I can definitely say now having a, a teenager in high school that her experience would not have been the same if we hadn't had common language and if those observations and opportunities had not been given to her um, at such a young age. Um, being okay, able to Kate, I'm going to interrupt just real quick because not everybody might not know what a, a 504 is. So, oh. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so um, a 504 plan is um, a, a plan that allows for specific accommodations due to um, an, an assessed need. Now, my daughter's needs uh, are not such that she would require an individualized educational plan, which is known as the IEP. Um, this was an opportunity that is similar. It still comes with um, legal protections for her in the classroom, and it also comes with um, opportunities for her specific accommodations to be provided, and that was made available to her through the school due to um, her diagnosis as what they would call other health impaired for um, uh, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. And so um, if if our story had not been that, I know that she would have had a lot more difficult time getting to the space where her emotional regulation is such that it is. And it was through that very early identification that that we were able, that we have been able, she has been able to have a successful um, school environment from very early on in her elementary years um, now on to high school. And we do uh, look forward to continuing to uh, uh, as she goes on into college. So with that, um, that is the end of my section. And we will go ahead and turn this over to um, Dr. Joanne Rojas. Hello, um, I am uh, Dr. Joanne Rojas. Um, and a quick visual description is I um, am a white woman with shoulder length brown hair and I am wearing a cream colored blazer and I have a blurred background behind me, but you might see, might notice that I have a bright orange wall behind me. <laughs> um, I'd like to, um, first of all, just let you know that um, as the um, as the Associate Director of Child Care Aware of Kentucky, and as um, a researcher and an educational psychologist, one of my favorite things to think about is um, learning. And uh, all I've actually learned so much from my colleagues earlier in this seminar. Um, and we're hoping that by the end of this two hour seminar, you'll have a lot of really good tools for helping the young ones in your life to develop autonomy in their learning, to build um, executive function skills, to build their brains like Christine was talking about earlier. Um, and what we're going to do in the beginning here is I'm going to share with you in just a moment, I'm actually going to have asked Kate to share with you in a moment, um, a very short three minute video um, that's called How to Build Autonomy in Early Childhood Classrooms. And while you are watching this video, I would like for you to notice, I would like for you to pay attention and notice in the video what 
things are empowering these young children to be successful. And so um, when you are a really great, it's been my experience that really effective child care providers, really effective teachers, and really effective family members tend to be great noticers. So I want you to encourage you to really pay attention and notice those things which are setting the children up for success. And as you notice things, feel free to go ahead and put it in the chat as you see those. And we'll talk a little bit about the things that you notice in this video as we get into the rest of the presentation. They're so long. They're so big. <laughs> and they wanted to come in together. We're looking to build self-confidence and self-reliant children. We're looking for children to be great critical thinkers and be able to make their own good decisions. That takes practice. Because we allow children to make their own decisions and to explore the world around them in a safe place, we see self-confident and joyful children. The Sarah Preschool is a three-year program. We're very child-oriented and we know what it means to play. Children learn through play. They learn success and they, they learn failure. It is a developmental milestone for them to come to school and to become aware of the fact that they are autonomous or becoming autonomous. Okay, you carry it. Where does it go? Let's go. Go put it on the drying rack. The more capable they feel about their successes, the more likely they are to be comfortable making mistakes until they make the right decision. Come on in, Louisa. Their day begins with greeting the teachers. I put my picture on there for every teacher will know that I'm there. Then they take off their shoes, put them on the rack, find their cubbies, and check in with the front room teacher. Now it's clean up here. Thank you, Avery. Wow, look at all these. You see the job chart. Children need responsibilities and they seek them out. So we're always looking for those opportunities. As the day continues, they'll hear that the art room and the block room area are open and the outside opens at the same time. They need to make choices. What will they be interested in doing now? They grow in their capacity to be self-directed. They become very well ordered and organized. They feel responsible for their own behaviors and they feel responsible as a group for things to go smoothly. And it's already time to go. If you have to, yeah. By the time they're ready to leave us, we have a cooperative group of children that are often considered leaders in the next step in the classroom, elementary classrooms, because of their ability to cooperate, to have empathy and compassion for other people, and to be good problem solvers. If you have not yet had the chance and would like to put something in the chat that you noticed, go right ahead. But I'll start with what I see there and I'll share a little bit about what I noticed in that short video. It looks like a whole bunch dropped just at once. That's great. Uh, one thing, um, Sharon mentioned that the child got to put her own artwork on the drying rack. Um, uh, Angela mentioned putting art in the dryer rack as well, walking into the child care, placing their own little attendance up on the board. Um, Carolyn talked about the same thing, putting the picture on the board. And clearly that little boy who shared was so proud <laughs> of the fact that the teachers knew he was there because he had put his attendance picture up. Um, Sharon talks about choices, about what type of play they want to do. And certainly anytime you give a child autonomy and choice, you are growing those um, cognitive and executive function skills that they need. Um, all of the children taking ownership of themselves and the center, the sense of community that they get. Um, Dustin said structured environments with pretty established roles and expectations. It's interesting how when you have that structured environment, 
it gives an opportunity for them to learn and they're sort of playing as they learning, like Angela talked about earlier, they're playing their roles. Um, and yet that structure gives them the freedom to be creative. Um, somebody, <laughs> somebody mentioned there was an adult on a phone, which is very bad <laughs> to be on a phone when you're supervising children, um, leaving their shoes off at the door, wanting to do jobs, uh, you know, very reminiscent of perhaps a Montessori environment. Um, and uh, Mary mentioned teachers being at the same level as children most of the time. And that definitely promotes conversation and mutual respect. Um, think about how you would feel if a very, very tall person, maybe eight feet tall, was talking down to you all the time. You would definitely feel, <laughs> you would feel disconnected from that person. So um, as we think about those things that you all noticed, and there were some really great um, things that were noticed, um, I want to think about also the fact that um, not only is it important to be a noticer, but when we're trying to develop these sorts of skills in children, we also have to be modelers. We need to be demonstrating for the children what skill it is that we're looking for them to demonstrate. And if we're expecting them to show self-control, for example, are we showing self-control as the adult in the room? Very important. And so um, I want us to think a little bit about, I have that what I'm going to share with you, um, are some executive function skills for life that set a child up um, and honestly set adults up for success throughout their lifetime. And these seven executive function skills are summarized from some of the work Ellen Galinsky has done with Mind in the Making, which is a really excellent professional development program that pulls together a wide variety of developmental science and puts it in a very accessible way so that parents, um, caretakers, family members, child care providers, teachers can understand all of the things that they are trying to understand. So the challenge is let's know the brain science. Let's understand what all of the experts are saying. Um, let's understand it for ourselves as adults, as caretakers, as parents, as family members, as teachers, as whatever the role is we have, social workers, whoever might be on this call. Um, understand it in your own life. Make sure that you have adequately developed those executive function skills. And then, only then, be intentional nurturing it in children. Uh, part of nurturing these skills in children is actually believing that they can learn and grow. Um, and so that's also very, very important. So the first um, executive function skill I'd like to talk about just a little bit is focus and self-control. Um, and I don't know about you, but this is a skill that I'm constantly working on. Um, our world is full of distractions and information overload. Um, I need focus and self-control as an adult to ensure that I get my work done. Um, I need to be able to pay attention. And that's the same thing I try to develop when I am caring for young ones. Um, do you know how to pay attention? Are you able to exercise self-control? Um, can you remember the rules? Can you remember the rules to shoots and ladders? What happens next? What happens uh, when I get a seven? Where am I going to end up? Can you count with me? Um, also thinking flexibly, um, grow, and that's a developmental skill, certainly, that comes with time, uh, but it's important for us to be able to en engage a child in such a way that they can learn to develop that skill. The second very important um, executive function skill is perspective taking. Um, and perspective taking is as you might think, it's understanding where other people are coming from and seeing how other people might view the world. When you think about very, very young children who are very egotistical, um, they can only see things from their perspective and it takes a while before you can be sitting on the other side of them and they know that you might see things from a different perspective. But as that grows, they not only understand that others have different perspectives, but they understand that others have their own thoughts and their own feelings. Um, and they can recognize the intention of the parents and the caretakers and the teachers who are giving them instructions. Um, and they, this is these are the skills they need in order to avoid conflicts with others and to learn how to problem solve on the front end. 
Um, and so these are the children who are going to make your life a little bit easier if you're in, tar in charge of classroom management because you're enabling them to understand that other people have perspectives. And so it's a way to build cooperation, um, especially among multiple children, whether that's multiple siblings in a family or multiple children in a classroom. Uh, the next important executive function skill that needs to be developed is communicating. And that is so much more than uh, words, so much more than reading and writing and arithmetic. It's so much more. Um, it, it goes beyond those academic skills, which children will learn um, in the appropriate context, but it's figuring out what to communicate when to communicate, how it's going to be understood by other people. Um, and it's when you look at long-term developmental success, when you talk to college professors and you talk to employers, they most often will say communication is the skill they're, they're most looking for in students and in workers. And so from the very earliest ages, if a child can learn to communicate and um, to give and take information that's going to be setting them up for long-term success. Our fourth skill is making connections. Um, and that is at the heart of learning. It's at the heart of connecting ideas to other ideas, connecting stories and books to their own lives, to their own um, experiences. Um, and is it helping them to understand this is the same, this is different, helps them to put things into categories, um, and also when a child is um, encouraged and applauded for making unusual connections, you're promoting creativity in that child. Because in order to be a creative person, again, long-term, a very important job skill, creativity, um, in order to be a creative person, you need to be able to make unusual connections and use information in new and valuable ways. Um, our, fi our fifth <laughs> um, executive function skill is critical thinking. Um, and again, this is one of those that we all pay lip service to, um, but it's the, it's the thing that will enable children, both from a young age and then on throughout adulthood, to analyze and evaluate information. Um, this will help guide their belief systems, their decisions, their actions. Uh, children need to make critical thinking a part of their, um, their repertoire in order to make sense of the world around them, in order to be able to solve problems. So critical thinking is, again, one of those things that can be developed through play. What happens when I knock over the blocks that my neighbor has put up there? Well, not only does the tower fall, but there are social and emotional implications of knocking over my friend's blocks. <laughs> Those are, um, that's actually a, an important part of critical thinking. And then um, the next one is taking on challenges. Um, I thought this was particularly nicely done in the video because the teacher who was talking, the director of that childcare, was talking about how important it was for children to experience both success and failure. Um, and that is part of taking on a challenge, uh, being willing to do something that's just outside of your ability to do, something that stretches you, and sometimes not doing it very well and having to dust yourself off and start again and try again. Um, and that's all part of the learning process. Um, when children take on challenges instead of avoiding them, they're better uh, at coping with challenges in school, at home, with friend groups, um, and it helps them long-term in life as well. So it's another really important executive function skill. Um, again, it's one, all of these, as I mentioned earlier, are ones that we need to demonstrate in order to develop and nurture in our young ones. And then our final um, executive function skill is getting children um, into self-directed and engaged learning. And that means helping them to set goals, helping them to understand the strategies for learning that will uh, assist them, helping them to um, become attuned to changes because we all know how quickly the world changes, um, helping them to be able to pivot when something happens in an unexpected way. Um, this helps them to, um, if they're self-directed and they're engaged, it helps them to follow their own curiosity 
it helps them to um, lean into their own imaginations and helps them to realize their potential. Um, and that can have great effects. Uh, the fact that when a child is very young, you want them to be thinking about all of the possibilities that they have um, in the world, all of the possibilities that they have for, um, for jobs, for work, for uh, building a family, for all of the things that, that young children are interested in doing. So as we think about these executive functions, I do want to encourage you always to be thinking about modeling those things that you want the children to do, um, whether they're your own children or children that you're responsible for in some kind of a care or educational setting. I want you to think about um, honestly examining your own ability to be successful in all of these executive function skills, and then realize that children can and do grow in these skills. Uh, and with nurture and help, uh, they can become quite successful at them. So I'd like to, um, I'm going to stop sharing um, and um, ask someone um, on my our team to please put in the chat the Mind in the Making link. Um, Mind in the Making, as I mentioned, is the work that has been um, uh, pulled together by Ellen Galinsky, and there are some really great family-friendly, educator-friendly resources at this link. Um, and there are many professional development opportunities around this developmental science. And so thank you so much for your attention. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to encourage you to share questions, um, especially really with anybody, but especially with with both um, Kate and me um, regarding expul expulsions and suspension, regarding executive function. You can put those in the chat um, and we would love to entertain those questions. Dr. Rojas, while we're, while, Rojas, while we're waiting um, for folks to drop it in the chat, I had a question. Um, how do you see the mind in the making training being used by early childhood professionals in their daily work with children and families? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so the mind in the making training, there's a lot of ways that you can get it. There is a book by Ellen Galinsky that's fairly family friendly that you can read. There is the website, as I mentioned. There also are trainers who offer mind in the making trainings. Um, I and Sally Dannenberg, who works with us here um, at Child Care Aware of Kentucky, um, offer these trainings uh, periodically to child care providers as well as to families. Um, and what we really do on a deep dive, not in a 15 minute snippet, <laughs> on a deep dive, what we do is there is a, a large um, eight module course that we can go through in face to face or synchronous online trainings. Um, that goes through these in depth, goes through the different age levels that might be appropriate for um, developing the skills at different times um, and helps people to get together also in small groups and to problem solve. Well, here's a scenario. If my child is three years old and is biting his classmates, what are some ways that I might solve this, taking into account all of these executive function skills that I'm looking to develop in the child? So that's one of the many ways that you might take it um, and use it. It's really about understanding the skill, applying it to yourself, and then um, applying it practic practically to the children around you. Thank that's you. A, oh, sorry, <laughs> Dr. Cooper. I was oh. gonna say that um, that was a really great answer, especially what you said at the end about um, applying to their own um, self and then applying to the children because Emma Green had a great question, which is, what are your suggestions for improving an adult's executive functioning skills so they can better help kids functioning? And that is such a huge one. That's one of the things that, um, so it just happens that HDI Learning has a number of courses uh, specifically on preventing suspension and expulsion. And there are a variety of techniques that are included in um, the modules. And it does focus on more of an adult first, child next um, type of approach so that um, there can be regular reflection by 
um, teachers and caregivers uh, so that they are considering, you know, what is my perspective on the behavior that I'm seeing right now? What are the ways that I can, um, well, the way that I talk about it is, if this is a low stakes environment versus a high stakes environment, how do we help our children learn and grow when they will not have the same level of negative consequence um, moving forward in life? And so how do you um, work with children to build all of those skills that um, Dr. Rojas just mentioned while you're within the classroom. And some of that can be modeling, some of that can be side by side. Uh, and oftentimes um, the peer interactions that they have in a group setting will assist as well. Also, um, another uh, way is really to try to be in, and this is something we go to in depth in the Mind in the Making trainings, is really to do some individual reflection where you there's a, an acronym that you use, which is WOOP, W-O-O-P, and W stands for WISH, and O stands for outcome, and the other O is for obstacle, and P is for plan. And basically what you do is you take one small thing that you'd like to see in yourself. I wish that I had greater self-control when I was tired at the end of the day. And you think what the outcome is and you imagine in a big way, the outcome would be that I will be the most lovely teacher at the end of the day and I'll be ready to greet parents and I'll be cheerful and I won't have a headache. And that's a beautiful outcome. But what are the obstacles to that outcome? And so you also think, okay, well, that's what I want to do. But the obstacle is in the afternoon, I don't have a sub, I need to take a break, whatever those things are. And you look at those obstacles and you come up with a plan to deal with those, not only the outcome that you're looking for, but also the obstacles and the plan that you need in order to get there. And so really being very honest with yourself and self-reflective um, is, a, is a good way to also develop that in an adult. I wanted to point out that Andrea Strasberg um, put in the chat that she was always told growing up there was not anything I could not do if I put my mind to it as someone that grew up with seizures and that this always made her think outside the box. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing that personal um, story. And then Kate, if I could, I had a question for you. Um, after listening to your section, I was wondering, are the numbers of African-American girls being expelled as staggering as the numbers of African-American boys? That is a great question. Um, there, The uh, research will show that there are a disproportionate number of children um, that are African-American when compared to white children um, being expelled from classrooms. However, then there is also a, an even wider disparity when it comes to African-American boys versus African-American girls. But yes, definitely, um, there, there have been studies to show that um, we have a, a disproportionate type of expectation for our um, younger children. And there's especially something called um, adultifying our young uh, African-American girls where they're expected to act at a much um, greater age range developmentally or they are per perceived to be um, acting in ways that they may not be developmentally um, able to at this point in time, like putting intention behind behavior when it's actually just a developmental, um, a, a part of their developmental phase. Hey, Dad. I have one more follow-up, if I may, um, or a, an additional question or thought. Can you speak just a little bit about the implicit bias? I know um, Dr. Walter Gillum um, has done extensive research on preschool expulsion and, and suspension, and he talks a lot about um, implicit bias um, in teachers. Did that, do you have any information around that? Absolutely. So implicit bias, um, where one of the very interesting studies that has come up is depending on um, the 
the race of the teacher and the race of the children, children's behaviors are perceived differently. And so that is an example of how um, that bias and perception may be there. Um, there was a study done where um, the uh, there was an observation of the number of times that a teacher's gaze would go to specific children. And there were children who were all participating in, in an activity that would be considered just the same average, safe type of play. Um, and the gaze towards African-American boys was much uh, more prevalent than the gaze towards the other children in the room uh, because, the, and, and it was looked at as specifically an expectation that the children that they were watching were going to misbehave um, versus other children in the room. Thank you, Kate. Very interesting information. Absolutely. And I see there's a question. Um, Lauren Rachels asks, can you elaborate on how teachers who use a specific curriculum and are required to can find opportunities for self-directed engaged learning as mentioned in the Mind in the Making? I'll, I'll start with this, but I'm hoping that Dr. Cooper might also jump in since she is our resident play person. Um, I do think that with Mind in the Making in particular, it's largely a mindset. Um, and so the idea is that these are skills that are growing in the children. And so in as much as it is possible, if there are certain stricture, uh, restrictions that you have, give the child opportunities to try new things, give them autonomy, give them the opportunity to choose this activity or that activity, even if it's within the same space. Um, give children opportunities to practice, um, allow for them to fail at something um, so that they can learn, oh, the last time I carried my little painting to the drying rack, I ran too fast. And so I fell and I ruined my little painting. And so that should teach them the next time that they want to bring their paper to the drying rack, they need to take a little bit more time um, and learn that sort of thing within the structures of the classroom. Um, it's certainly not um, having children um, having children uh, run wild to to encourage autonomy and um, encourage them to build those self-regulation skills. And play is not that either. Um, Dr. Cooper, do you have anything to add about play um, and integrating it into curriculum? Um, yes, I was getting, I was thinking the same thing. I think it's important to um, realize that when we allow children to play as their learning experience, it doesn't mean that there are no rules or that it is unsafe or that they are just willy-nilly around the room. Um, we set expectations for the play. The adult or the teacher, early childhood education professional should be facilitating the play, setting up opportunities for play, um, for also uh, autonomy. But then also the play should be child-directed. So oftentimes the adult tends to want to direct the play. And if they allow the children to take... Um, ownership of their play um, and set up opportunities where the play is challenging yet achievable. Um, I think that is extremely important and lends itself to the mind in the making as well, because the teacher or the adult has to have ex their executive functioning, those seven skills in play to be able to give up that control and allow children to learn on their own through play and through guided play. I hope that answers my part of the question. I thought that was a beautiful answer. <laughs> So I have one last question, and then I think we're going to jump into um, breakout rooms. But uh, my question is for you, Dr. Roas. How do you see Mind in the Making training as a suspension and expulsion tool? 
Oh, that's a great question. I think that one of the things I like about understanding executive function as something that develops over a lifetime um, is that when there is a lack of it, we understand that there are opp opportunities to nurture it. So if a child is exhibiting difficult behaviors, I understand as the child care teacher, as the director, as the principal, um, that that child is lacking in some executive function skills. And so I will look at ways to help them to develop those. I would also look at the environment that they're in. Um, and does the teacher, for example, have adequate supports in order to be able to manage the classroom that she or he is responsible for? Um, if we are thinking about children as um, not as needing to fit into particular boxes in order to not be troublesome, if instead we think about children as learn, little learning human beings who are like the rest of us, we need to show grace to ourselves when we are lacking in self-control or being able to take on a challenge. Same goes for the children um, that we're responsible for. And I think if our default is not, okay, let's get the troublemaker out of the classroom. If our default is let's give the supports to this child so that they can learn more successful behaviors, then the um, they're not going to immediately be sent out and to be either suspended or expelled. Yeah, I think um, if you are at that level of concern that that is an indication that there's more going on there. So that might be a really good example of when a referral might be appropriate. If a child is not really able to successfully um, you know, function in that, that environment, then are additional supports needed? Like um, Dr. Cooper was referencing like visual schedules or like helping prepare a child um, kind of that, that might have trouble with self-regulation, getting ready to transition from one activity to the next. So um, those additional supports may be needed by that child for a very real reason, you know, if there is some underlying issues going on with their learning. And if I could, before we move on, I would also like to say, I think that it would be important to introduce social emotional learning through play at this juncture, because if you use play to teach um, social emotional skills, such as empathy, communication, and self-regulation, um, that can go a long way in the classroom management as well. Um, and role playing scenarios, you can also, um, the teacher could facilitate those type of scenarios to help children practice conflict resolution, um, sharing, taking turns, modifying their own behaviors, um, understanding and identifying their own behaviors. Um, so, yeah, I think that lends itself to that as well, Kate. Thank you. Those are wonderful answers. Um, Walt, I think we're ready, if you are ready, that to go into breakout rooms for about, looks like six minutes, maybe seven. Okay, I, I am ready. I will enable the breakout, breakout rooms for about six or seven minutes. Wonderful. And what we would like everyone to do in those breakout rooms are uh, share something that you learned today. What was um, surprising or what is something that you'll take with you uh, after our seminar today? And then we will come back together and I will not expect everyone to report out, but we will do what's called a waterfall where um, everyone will type that answer into the chat, but not hit send. And I'll say that again when we come back out. So in the breakout room, Please think of and discuss something that you learned today or you will take with you. I did want to add that we don't have facilitators in each of those breakout rooms. So you can start um, you can start sharing amongst yourselves. So don't wait for somebody to lead. Step out and be bold and um, and share one of your takeaways.
Um, I just had one question. Um, I am. I would like to know more about early, services. early childhood um, education and um, dexterity and things of that nature that they can take through them to through the lifespan, especially for those for, with people with disabilities so that they can take that across the lifespan with them and be independent as people with disabilities. Repeat that. You were, you were cut off. I'm sorry. It, it was, uh, I would like to know more about early childhood education and like what needs to be emphasized in order for people with that are have disabilities take that through them through early childhood into adulthood so they can incorporate that into being self-productive when they're older and things of that nature that would be very helpful uh, sorry i don't understand your question it's it bit what what kind of dexterity things that would that children learn and play and things of this nature to be not be so standoffish vers versus go after and be able to do instead of people do for them um is i really think that i really think that comes down to back to the curriculum part so if we had uh scenarios where we would we would take them on little field trips. I mean, even if it's just to a park, um, just to get them out of this, out of the enclosed setting of a school. I mean, it's a big, it's a roomy box, but it's a, a, a box is a box is a box. And I think if we, if we take them out into the world, because the world is where they're going to end up at the end of the day, and the world doesn't adapt to them, they we have to adapt to it. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome back to the main stage, everybody. We hope that you had some wonderful conversations and um, that there's something that you will be able to uh, take with you today. What I'd like to ask everyone to do is go into the chat as you are able and type into the chat a sentence on something that you will that you learned today or will take with you, but wait on hitting send um, because I'm going to, in about a minute and a half, ask everyone to click the send button all at the same time. And we're gonna see all of the things that were learned today. So again, please type one thing into the chat that you learned or will take with you. And in just a few more seconds, we will go ahead and hit send. Just hold for that cue and I'll get back to you in just a moment. All right, is everybody ready? I'm gonna count down. I'm gonna count down three to one. And when I get to one, we hit send. Three, two, one. <laughs> it's just a fun little way to, to finish out and to see that um, we all have great things that we'll take with us today. Um, I'll give everyone a moment to read through these if you'd like. Um, one that just jumped out at me immediately is I will use whoop. Love that. Uh, I said in the background that I will not confuse my rallying call, which is whoop with whoop. But, you know, I think we will all remember whoop today. Executive functioning, ASQ for free. Um, yes, it is very heart wrenching to hear about expulsion being used in preschool aged children. Um, 
play across the lifespan. Oh my goodness, so many wonderful, wonderful things. So I hope that you will take a moment to um, read through these as we finish up. And Walt, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you if there's any uh, final housekeeping that we need. We've got one minute until we are finished out for today. Thank, thank you. I want to thank our panelists for taking time out of their day to share their experiences and expertise and knowledge with us. We are so grateful for the variety of perspectives which brought richness to the conversation. Thank you for an informative panel. Be well. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.